For the past four years, Marco had seen Papa only twice a year. He and his mother and younger sisters had moved into another rhythm of existence. He woke with the roosters, went to school in the mornings, and helped Mama with Maria, Lilia, and Irma in the afternoon. During harvest, he worked in the corn or teote fields and counted the days until Papa would come home. The money orders always preceded him. They made Mama happy and made Papa seem godlike in her eyes. They still did not own a house, but now they were able to pay the rent on time and had plenty left over for things like a television and the clothes and games Marco's sisters had, had always Marco's sisters always wanted. They had money for the market and food, especially for the occasions when Papa came home and Mama cooked meat and sweets every day. The first few nights were always the same. Mama made birria, goat stew, and capirotada, bread pudding. Then Papa went out with his compadres to drink and to tell of his work in Los Estados, the States. The family would have his company for a month, and then he would go back to that unknown place, disappearing somewhere beyond the vision of the departing bus. What is it like, Papa? Marco always asked. I live in an apartment above a garage with eight messy men. We get up early, when it's still dark, to start our work in the flower fields. In the afternoon, we go back to the apartment. We take turns going to the store to buy tortillas, a little meat, some fruit. There's a television, so we watch the Spanish stations. We talk, we talk about sports in Mexico and our families. There's room on the floor to sleep. On weekends, we sometimes play football at the school and drink a few cervezas. Sometimes we have regular work, but other times we go and stand on the corner in front of the gas station with the hope we will be picked up by the contractors who need someone to dig a ditch or do some other job a gringo won't do. It goes on like this until it's time to come back to Mexico. For several years, Marco had begged to go with Papa. His parents finally decided that now that he was 14, he was old enough to help support the family. With both Marco and Papa working, the family could buy a house next year. Mama had cried for three days before they left. When it was time to board the bus to Guadalajara, Ma Marco had hugged his mother tight. Mama, I will be back. It will never be the same, she said. Besides, some come back and some do not. Marco knew he would return. He already looked forward to his first homecoming, when he would be celebrated like Papa. As the bus pulled away from Xocotepec, Marco had waved out the small window to the women and for the first time in his life had felt like a man. Marco leaned back on the hard bench on the Tijuana street and closed his eyes. He already missed Chocotepec and his sisters playing in the cornfields behind the house. He even missed the annoying neighbor's dog barking and Mama's voice waking him too early for mass on Sunday morning when he wanted to sleep. Papa nudged him. Stay close to me, he said, grabbing Marco's shirt sleeve. Marco sat up and looked around. There was nothing unusual happening on the street. What had Papa seen? The Coyote. A squat, full woman wrapped in a red shawl came down the sidewalk with a determined walk. Marco thought her shape resembled a small Volkswagen. Her blue-black hair was pulled back into a, into a tight donut on, on the top of her head, not one strand out of place. Heavy makeup hid her face like a painted mask, and her red mouth was set in a straight line. As she passed, she glanced at Papa and gave a quick nod. Let's go, he said. That's the coyote, said Marco, but it is a woman. Shh, said Papa. Follow me. Papa weaved between the tourists on the street, keeping the marching woman in his sight. She pulled out a beeping cell phone and talked into it, then turned off the main avenue and headed deeper into the town's neighborhood. 
Others seemed to fall in with Papa and Marco from doorways and bus stops until they were a group of eight, five men and three women. Up ahead, the coyote woman waited at a wooden gate built into the middle of a block of apartments. She walked in and the little parade followed her. They continued through a dirty callejon between two buildings, picking their way around garbage cans until they reached a door in the alley wall. In there, she ordered. Marco followed Papa inside. It seemed to be a small basement with plaster walls and a cement floor. Narrow wooden stairs led up one wall to some place above. A light bulb with a dangling chain hung in the middle of the, of the room, and in a corner was a combination television and video player with stacks of children's videotapes on the floor. The woman came inside, shut the door, and bolted it. The, women, the men and women turned to face her. 1200 for each, American dollars, she said. Marco almost choked. He looked around at the others, who appeared to be peasants like him and Papa. Where would they have gotten that kind of money? And how could Papa pay $2,400 for the two of them to cross the border? The transients reached into their pockets for wallets, rolled up pant legs to get to small leather bags strapped around their legs, unzipped inside pouches of jackets, and were soon counting out the bills. Stacks of money appeared. The coyote walked to each person, wrote his or her name in a notebook, and collected the fees. Papa counted out 120 bills, all 20s, into her chubby palm. In his entire life, Marco had never seen so much money in one room. Esusha, listen. Since September 11, I have had trouble trying to get people across with false documents, she said. So we will cross in the desert. I have vans and drivers to help. We'll leave in the middle of the night. If you need to relieve yourself, use the alley. The television does not work, only the video. Her cell phone beeped again. She put it to her ear and listened as she walked up the, stairs, up the stairs, which groaned and creaked under her weight. Marco heard a door close and a bolt latch. It was almost dark. Marco and Papa found a spot on the concrete floor near the video player. Marco put his backpack behind him and leaned against it, protecting himself from the soiled wall where probably hundreds of backs had rested. One of the women, who was about Mama's age, smiled at Marco. The others, tired from their travels, settled on the floor and tried to maneuver their bags for support. No one said much. There was murmuring between people sitting close to each other, but despite the obligatory polite nods, anxiety prevented too much interaction. A man next to Papa spoke quietly to him. His name was Javier, and he'd been crossing for 12 years. He had two lives, he said, one in the United States and one in his village in Mexico. The first few years of working in the States, he dreamed of the days he would go home to Mexico and his family. But now he admitted that he sometimes dreaded his trips back. He wanted to bring his wife and children with him to work and live in the U.S., but they wouldn't come. Now he went home only once a year. What worried him was that he was starting to prefer his life on the other side to his life in Mexico. Papa nodded as if he understood Javier. Marco said nothing because he knew that Papa was just being polite. He would never prefer the United States to Mexico. Marco was too nervous to sleep. He reached over and took several videotapes from the pile. They were all cartoon musicals, luckily in Spanish. He put one in the machine, the Lion King, and turned the volume down low. Trance-like, he watched the lion, Simba, lose his father. Hakuna Matata sang the characters on the video. No worries. A series of thoughts paraded through Marco's mind. The desert, snakes, the possibility of being separated from Papa, drinking beer, with the men in Chocotepec after eating goat stew, a woman coyote, scorpions. He closed his eyes, 
and the music in the video became the soundtrack of his piecemeal nightmare. Hours later, Papa woke Marco. Now, mijo, let's go. Marco, jarred from sleep, let Papa pull him up. He rubbed his eyes and tried to focus on the others who headed out the door.